A body is discovered in an unusual location. You're at a cemetery. It's full of dead bodies. But this one is not in a grave. He has no ID on him at all. He was sort of just dumped there. The investigation reveals a love triangle that might have turned violent. I think that she is obsessed. He said he's going to break up with her. I went to him and asked him, have you lost your mind? Detectives uncover a killer with a single-minded need for more. She wanted to see if she could get his last paycheck and the insurance policy. It was all part of her cold, callous personality. She is a master manipulator, manipulating people up to do her dirty work. He's evil. I know that. He's evil. I'm going to tell you everything. On Sunday, January 17th, 2010, Detectives in San Antonio, Texas, receive an unusual phone call from a patrolman making rounds in the city. About a quarter to five, the phone rang, and the patrolman said, I'm out at the cemetery, and there's a dead body. And I'm like, right, you're at a cemetery. It's full of dead bodies. And she says, yes, ma'am, but this one is not in a grave. So I said, okay. So I drove over to the cemetery. When Detective Miller arrives at the cemetery, she is briefed on the discovery. A tourist went out for a walk. He said when he walked past the cemetery, he noticed someone he thought was sleeping. When he turned around to go back to his hotel, he looked again and noticed that the body had not moved. At first glance, Detective Miller doesn't see an obvious cause of death. You could actually see that there was blood in the chest area and in the head area. So we called the medical examiner, and as soon as they rolled him over, it was obvious that he had been shot multiple times at that time. I'm not going to try to count bullet holes because you don't know what's entrance, you don't know what's exit. It's always better to just wait for the autopsy. Given the condition of the body and lack of blood at the scene, investigators surmise that the victim was shot several days earlier. I would say the body was in lividity. He was very rigid. It was very clear that he was just sort of just dumped there. Where the victim was killed isn't the only mystery. He has no ID on him at all. It's going to be a John Doe. So we had to find out who he was. We started working to see if anybody had made a, a recent report of, you know, of a missing, young, apparently healthy black male. Missing persons found a recent report that matched his general description. His name was Samuel Johnson. 26-year-old Samuel Johnson Jr. had been reported missing by his parents after failing to come home from work on January 13th. He was supposed to go to work and then he would be back. His mom was unable to get in touch with him. He's not answering his phone. Samuel was not the kind of person that just fell off the map, you know, he wouldn't just walk away and, and not tell you or tell somebody. Nobody's been able to contact him. He was missing. That was a sign that something was up. He is too responsible a uh, young man for that. The desk sergeant asked for the description. We filed a missing person report. It's been five days since Samuel went missing, and his family is still holding out hope they will find him. Meanwhile, 40 miles away, a medical examiner is attempting to ID the John Doe. We went looking for him. At this point, my mind is all over the place. You know, I just wanted to know where, where my son is.
it was uh, I was ecstatic and nervous, uh, you know, being first time father, uh, and I was afraid to hold him because I'm that's how I am with babies, and, and he was so he was so small, and it just felt like he was just gonna roll right out of my hands, you know. But um, I eventually held him, and you know. Just, it was just, it's a feeling you just can't, you can't describe being a first time father. And of course, my wife was telling me, does, does he have five fingers? I mean, 10 fingers, 10 toes, and everything. I said, yeah, everything's there. Everything's there. So, you know, we were, we were proud and happy. He, he, he was smart. I knew he was going to be smart. And that may have sound selfish because people always said, Sam, that's cause you smart. You're gonna think y'all said, yeah, he's gonna be smart. He probably gonna, he's gonna be smarter than I am. You know. And that's that's the way I raised him. I wanted him to succeed. But I also wanted him to know that he may have to work twice as hard out here because of who he is and because of how he carries himself. You know, but you know, just always be your, be who you are, be your own person, and that's where I raised all my kids to be independent, not dependent. Although we loved them to death as parents, we taught them all to be able to stand on your own two feet. Erica was like another daughter to me; she was like my daughter's big sister, and that was an instant click because. I think our, our values and our ideals were one and the same. I didn't talk to Vanessa. My wife talked to Vanessa. No, I, I had no rapport with Vanessa whatsoever. It was, it was like the script was flipped, but he didn't want to show the fact that it was flipped because he, was, he wasn't himself. And as a parent, you know when something is wrong. But you also know, I also know myself, when I was growing up, I, you know, as a man, it's hard to approach a, uh, another young man that's trying to find his way and tell him, hey, you know, son, that at the end of that cliff, the end of this road, there's a cliff. It's hard to get that to a, through a kid's head when he's trying to become a man because he knows it all. Since we had to testify, we, we wasn't in on too much, too much of the trials other than when it came to closing. That's the only time we were allowed because we were called as witnesses. But uh, based on uh, our family reaction, the ones that were actually sitting through both cases, uh, just the look on their faces, and I gauge everything by watching my daughter. And when my daughter comes in with almost tears in her eyes, that's not good. Nothing tears my heart apart than to see my daughter or my wife cry. And they are, those are two strong women. They don't cry easily. I knew then whatever was going on wasn't wasn't good. And then when I finally, uh, on closing, got to see and hear what they were saying, I can understand. Lie after lie after lie, but then again, that's to be expected, because that's all they were about. She wanted so much to hurt my family, yet she wanted so much to be a part of my family. People ask, why you think she did this? I said, well, thank well, first of all, it was, it was a money factor. Second of all, Samuel was everything she wanted to be. Samuel came up in a, a, a household that wasn't dysfunctional. She wanted what he had, and that was love of family. 
knowing that there's always somebody I can depend on. Well, when I start an interview, I like to go really slow because I like to get background information. And I also, even after, you know, no matter what they say, I still have more questions. Well, how do you think it led up to this or whatever? Um, I really like to take my time. I know Lisa does too. You just don't know during the investigation or even by the time the case is handed over to the district attorney's office, you don't know what piece of information that you got from the interrogation or the interview. You don't know what's going to be important. So that background information could really play into you know, the case and, and you just don't know. So while I'm in the interview room and I'm talking to Vanessa and getting all her background and stuff, you know, she's the one that told me they'd been together two and a half years, they had a baby together, she knew that Sam was engaged to Erica, she knew, of course, Sam's parents, uh, she said she had gone to uh, Mississippi, she even, I remember her trying to pull receipts out from her purse saying, hey, look, look, I was here, I was here, I got receipts. Well, um... The first thing she told me when I asked her who I who she thought had committed the murder, she actually threw Erica under the bus. She said that Erica is the one that probably had something to do with Sam's murder. After Vanessa said that um, Erica was probably responsible for Sam's murder, um, I then let her know that I had spoke to Adrian. Um, she doesn't know what Adrian said, but I do. Um, that's when Vanessa said that, well, yeah, um, I told Adrian that um, Sam had gone over to the house, they were supposed to beat Sam up, but it must have went too far and they ended up killing him. Um, she did try to get herself out of trouble by throwing Susan, her boyfriend, and Keisha under the bus, and that's when my sergeant said, look, I'm going to ask you, you know, did you know that Sam was going to be killed when he went to your house to pick up the money. And she said yes. And it wasn't until that point that she admitted that she was involved in the plot to kill Sam. She tried, she did everything she could to stay out of it. You know, she was willing to let her sister and cousins go down for the murder and leave herself out of it. Um, absolutely, hands down. She didn't care if they went to prison, and she didn't. Lakeisha, at first, didn't know anything about it. Uh, you know, Lisa confronted her and said, you know, Susan's already told us, we know. Um, at that point, Lakeisha was willing to give the story, and, and she was a little more detailed. Uh, she said that, yes, uh, Sam had come over, Susan gave him the money. When he was uh, brought into the house or asked to walk into the house, uh, Keisha actually admitted to hitting him in the head with a two-by-four, which then confirms what, you know, the M.E. had found on his head, the contusion on his head. Vanessa Cameron belongs in prison as much as anybody I've ever seen. She proved herself time and again to be dangerous to people around her. Vanessa got everything she deserved. I would have liked to have seen a life with no chance of parole. And I'll tell you why. She was completely unapologetic for what she had done. She justified that to herself. Hey, Sam was not happy alive. So I made a little money off of his death. So what? He's happy now. He's, he's famous. Yeah, she, she does not belong out in society. She literally reaped what she sowed. Um, she didn't just, well, I know she didn't pull the trigger, but she still murdered Sam because she was an active participant in it. She's the one that solicited it. She's the one that uh, orchestrated the whole idea um, but she didn't just kill him. She killed the relationship that he would have had with his firstborn son. She completely destroyed the potential for his second son. So for me, for court, um, it was hard uh, for the most of it, you know, because I was like a key witness, I had to be holed up, you know, in another uh, part of uh, the courthouse. But I just remember being like on the stand, like in the first trial, the second trial, and just 
like having to see images of your loved one, like, like with no life, you know. She tried to pin it on me and that gave me a lot of insight as far as like what she really thought about me, that I was always in the back of her mind for her to pin it on me. She actually feared the friendship that Sam and I had because she knew that that was real. I don't get to hear my brother's voice for my birthday, wishing me happy birthday. I don't get to see him at Thanksgiving dinner. I don't get to talk to him for his birthday. He doesn't get to see his sons. The only way, I, I could never pick up Samuel. He was almost six feet. I think he was 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 I could never pick him up. I can pick him up now. He's in an urn. He's in an urn that weighs no more than five pounds. That's how I talk to my brother. I'm older than my oldest brother. All because somebody wanted money. So, yeah, I just, as a family, we reminisce and we, we talk about the bittersweet times. And it's like um, I get up every morning and I rub his urn. And I let him know how much I miss him. And... I just tell him that we're going to make sure that everybody involved does their time because what they did to him was not necessary. If he wanted to leave, let him go. Let him go. You don't turn around and kill somebody just because you want some money. So, yeah, I just... I feel that I'm at a point now where I have a little bit of closure, but I will never have complete closure because I hurt every day. I hurt every day.